Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And today's video is really special. We're going to be talking about cast gold. I do want you to know that I have several videos on YouTube. Feel free to take a look at them and I hope that uh, you like them. Give me some feedback and subscribe so that I can be encouraged to make more videos. That would be great. But today we're going to talk about cast gold. And I have to mention Dr. Richard V. Tucker. This man pioneered the technique we're going to discuss today. And he was a beautiful man and my friend. And my direct mentor, Dr. Warren Johnson, who is an amazing mentor and very inspirational in his techniques. So let's perform a brief overview of the technique that we're trying to teach. These are amalgam restorations that are obviously defective. We like to clean out the caries and the old material and then we perform a procedure called a blockout, which gives us an ideal preparation and then we can cement the castings. This technique was also applied to this particular case on a young patient that wanted to have the longest lasting restorations. And I think that if done conservatively can be very aesthetic. This young woman had several composite restorations which were failing after just about five or six years. So we cleaned out the caries, performed the preparations as we do, took impressions, and then we were able to cement the castings on this case, keeping the outline forms nearly as restricted as the original composites. And another patient, a dentist friend of mine, with defective composite restorations after about six years, these composites were removed, blocked out, prepared for gas gold, and then the case was cemented, showing virtually no gold when the patient smiled. We can even use the gold to replace small little cavities like this, and it can be very retentive and very conservative. This is a little OL. Or large cavities, uh, defective teeth that have cracks in them. We can utilize the technique by utilizing pins that are part of the gold casting, picking up an impression with these little analogs and then incorporating the gold into these little pins, cementing it, thereby achieving a stronger result. So the technique is very versatile and it can be used in all cases, even cases like this, which are very conservative and the preparations can be made quite small, almost about the size of a composite and we can preserve a lot of tooth structure, really a lifetime restoration. So let's do some prep planning because we're going to start with the MO on a molar. And I like to sort of think about what does the tooth look like before we begin? Where are we going to get our primary retention? What is the outline form going to look like? Unlike an amalgam, an inlay has to have flares. These exit angles have to be quite obtuse. So when you're thinking about the inlay, you want to think about a narrow axial wall and a wide exit. So I've drawn the outline form here on the molar so you can get an idea what the shape would be. Quite different than an amalgam. This is called the flare. And this is another flare. And notice how the flares don't touch the adjacent teeth. If we were to superimpose the axial wall right here, we can measure the angle formed from the flare to the axial wall. And that measurement should be 135 degrees. The amount of clearance that we have will be about 0.75, a lot more than an amalgam. So let's start with step one, the pulpal depth cut. And for this, I like to use a 330 burr because it measures 1.6 millimeters in length. And what we can do is we can use the 330 burr, even though we know its shape is not right for this particular preparation, it is convergent. But we're gonna go ahead and prepare a little slit along the occlusal. Once the slit is completed, you can take a look at how deep you are and measure with 330 burr. This is a great start for this particular preparation, so you know that you're not going to be too shallow. Inlays rely 
very much on the length of the walls. So let's make sure that we have adequate length. Now we can start to change the preparation into the occlusal inlay through an outline form modification done with a 57 burr. And some people like to use a tapered fissure burr for this step, but I'd recommend that we stay away from that, that we stay with the 57 burr as Dr. Tucker had always recommended because we want to develop the amount of draw or taper or total occlusal divergence that the case demands. And we can use this straight fissure burr to create that kind of divergency. So you can see here we're tipping the burr towards the buccal, towards the distal, towards the lingual, all the while maintaining the pulpal depth that was created with the 330 burr. So we don't go deeper pulpally, we just want to expand the outline form and make it draw with the opposing walls. You can see that we've mainly focused on the facial wall at this point. So we're going to go ahead and maybe do a little more refining on that facial wall and then I'm going to turn the typodont sideways so you can see how we develop the draw on the lingual wall. And I think that this will make it very clear. You know, one of the things I'm sure you noticed while we were preparing there was that my hand was rotating buccal, lingual, mesial, and distal in order to get the appropriate amount of taper in all areas. And we were doing that while not deepening the pulpal wall, just letting the end of the burr rest up against the pulpal wall. Inlays should not be too narrow. They need to be wide enough so that we can adequately finish the gold when we're finished. And we're going to go ahead and show you what this initial step would look like. And there it is. You can see it has decent draw. We're going to do the flares now. And this is going to be accomplished utilizing a 169L. You could use the 57, but I found that utilizing the 169L in these critical areas does tend to avoid nicking the adjacent tooth a little bit better. And we're going to run these flares straight out and follow that 135 degree relative to the axial wall direction. And notice how the burr just clears right through the adjacent tooth. And we're going to perform the same procedure on the lingual side. You can see here from this uh, mesial view that I'm going to be following the draw that we've established on the occlusal and just pushing the burr straight out. So I'm making a nice long stroke like we're making a golf swing. See how we're, we're going straight out. That tends to make the, the wall very straight and of the proper shape and form. The 169L is really uh, very, very small at the end and you can use it comfortably without causing any problems with uh, nicking the adjacent tooth. You can run this burr around the periphery just to create a little more smoothing if you wanted to at this point, just for efficiency's sake, rather than switching back to the 57. But, you know, the, the whole idea is to try to be efficient and perform each step to the best of your abilities so that when you're done, you, you can't be any better at that point. I typically find that the 169L works very well to kind of level out the, the draw on the occlusal, as you can see in this area. Let's go ahead and start the proximal box. And for that, we're going to stay with the 169L. And we're going to show you here with a pencil about where you would drop the burr. The burr is going to be situated right here in the middle of the contact area. And then you want to tip the burr out towards the facial and towards the lingual when the burr is dropped in this particular area. So just like you would with, uh, with an amalgam preparation or a composite preparation, you want to keep a little bit of a shell of tooth structure adjacent to the, the, the tooth so that you uh, don't have any problems with uh, nicking that area. And I think that this works really well. You don't 
really worry about going too deep axially because the burr is incredibly narrow and very conservative. So we just use the burr, kind of tipping it buckly and lingually and working our way down. And ultimately we're, we're going to break the gingival contact and we're going to break the facial and lingual contacts as well. But we just have to spend some time pushing the burr more gingerly to, to get that. Notice also that I'm leaning the burr a little bit distally to maintain the axial wall divergence occlusally. So we just continue on making a little bit wider buckle lingually, always thinking about the fact that our end point for this step is going to be the existing flare on the occlusal. You notice that we established the flares on the occlusal before we decided to drop our proximal box, and this is a very important step. It's very efficient to do it this particular way. So now we're going to push the burr out further, and we're going to use that existing wall as our guide to how to tip the burr. We know exactly what kind of draw we want because we know we already have the draw that is required on that gingival area by following the occlusal area. I'm always impressed when people are able to do this with a 57 burr because I, I find this space a little bit too tight for a burr of that size, but I'm sure it can be done. So at this point, let's just uh, blow it off a little bit and then kind of give you an idea what it looks like. So you could hear the hampi slow down in certain areas while we were doing this refinement. And I think that's very important to do, to control the handpiece and the burr. The angulation of the box flares are going to be the same as the occlusal. So if you hold the burr here and then you hold it here, those two should be the same. You want to hold the burr upright when you go into the box. So you line the burr up with the occlusal part and don't tip the burr, but just take the burr at that orientation and move it along the proximal wall to create the proper draw. It's a very important step right there like that. So let's go ahead and look at refinement. And this is where hand instrumentation comes into play. And if you look at this uh, matrix here, on the MO inlay, we're going to be utilizing the 43S. On the DO inlay, we're going to use the 42S off angle chisels. For the bevel, we're going to use a 233 tucker for the MO and a 232 tucker for the DO. So I'm going to show you how to use these particular instruments, but I think that this matrix is really important to remember. This is the 43S off-angle chisel. Here is the usual margin trimmer, tucker style, with a very steep end to it. And this is used to create the proper amount of bevel at the gingival. So let's go ahead and make these changes. We're going to show you that we're going to use the off-angle chisel to slide down the proximal wall and then over on the gingival wall towards a line angle. Line angles are created by moving the hand instrument two different orientations back into the same line angle. So we use the secondary cutting edge of the instrument along the axial wall and the primary cutting edge to establish the line angle along the proximal. And you can see now we've turned the instrument around so that we can get the lingual refinement completed. If you leave a little gouge in the axial wall when you're doing this, you can turn the instrument sideways like this and you can chop down this wall. Just a few strokes doesn't take much and you remove that little gouge and make that wall a little bit nicer. It's really important though to remember not to undercut the axial wall. It should always be leaning back at this point, the preparation has a, a decent refinement, so now we're ready to go to the gingival bevel. And there are a couple of different ways of doing this. I love this burr called the H248S009 from Brassler. This burr has got a 60 degree angle on the tip, and we can run the burr just across that gingival and create maybe a 0.3 millimeter up to maybe 0.5 millimeter bevel. You don't need a lot of bevel, and you can run the instrument back and forth in this area. 
but typically the instrument is not able to get into the line angles on the facial and the lingual side. So that requires a second step of going in with the Tucker 233 gingival margin trimmer and smoothing the bevel over to the edge to make sure that we've got the bevel complete from one side to the other. I think that that's a really important step to follow. So now we're ready to go into the really final step, which is the occlusal bevel. And we don't need to make a major bevel here. We just have to smooth the outline form with either a 7901 or maybe a 7404. I also like to use a burr called a 7102 here on the left. And no matter which burr you use, you have to remember that it's the burr that's doing the work for you. Just hold it upright and allow the burr angle to create this minor change to your outline form. Let's take a look as I put the final touches on this prep. So you can see that it's just a subtle change, but it does create a nice outline form. You can look at it from the side and see that the burr is doing the work for you if you hold the burr along the long axis of the preparation. Just allow that tapered part of the burr to do the work for you. It works incredibly well, and you end up having a pretty decent outline form. The next thing we're going to do is just assess the preparation as we've completed it and see where we did some good things and where we can make some improvements. Explorer can be used to clean out the prep and look for sharpness of line angles. We can measure the depth of an RGS-1 or an RGS-2, which is 2 millimeters deep, and this really gives us an idea that we're proper depth. The clearance is 0.75 on both buccal and lingual as measured with an RGS-2. And let's take a look at the axial depth at the gingival. This is an RGS-3 showing you that it's approximately 1 millimeter. The width of the isthmus is about 1.6, 1.7, somewhere in there. And it's going to be about one-third or less of the occlusal table buccal lingually. So the prep is essentially completed. It has a gingival bevel, proximal flares, dovetail, and adequate depth. You can see here also that it is very sharp and clean from the outside. It's always a good view to look from this outside view to make sure everything is in really good condition and that the walls are straight with no undercuts. So I want to thank you for the time that you've spent watching this video. I do want to let you know that we have a hands-on course in Los Angeles for conservative cast gold restorations. It's going to be held in January from the 18th to the 20th. It'll be a 20-hour course and every participant will make two castings in our laboratory and our teaching facility that they can take home with them and we're going to go over the Tucker technique in great detail. The course is only going to have 12 participants, so it's going to be very, very special. Look forward to seeing you then, hopefully.